Hello and welcome. We're back with missionary and medical extraordinaire in uh, many countries around the world, Pastor David Syme. Thank you for joining us again. Pleasure. David, you, you shared a, an overview of your life's work and journey. Um, and something that you touch on in your book is this idea of uh, God revealing himself. And I wonder, could you share a couple of examples of um, of how God revealed himself in your life? Yeah, probably many, and that's what the book is actually <laughs> trying to do, but, you know, to give um, our viewers an idea, and I will follow through on one story, true story, that it actually took place. Just setting the context mm -hmm. of that, um, what what kind of pushed me in this direction? I was I was looking at um, how how people see chance. And uh, there's a tendency that when we don't understand, people say, "Oh, well, that was good luck. That was just chance." Mm -hmm. But Carl Jung, the famous Swiss uh, psychiatrist, in his studies, he coined a word in the English language and the Swiss language, I think, too, mm -hmm. called synchronicity. And by synchronicity, he means that in life, you can look at a situation and you can see a number of unlinked, mm -hmm. unattached events yes. that take place sometimes immediately or sometimes over time. But when you look at the end and the result of those, it's actually something quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. And he studied this quite a bit and wrote quite a lot about it. Mm -hmm. and, and that started me thinking because he had a statement in his writing where he said, I know this to be a fact and mm -hmm. it's there that, that things happen and we they happen, they are linked in one way or another, but we don't fully understand it and we don't know what causes it. Yes, they're, they're meaningful yes, in some it, way. Exactly. Coincidences, mm -hmm. but meaningful coincidences. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it was that that then started my thinking to think about this in terms of God, because as a Christian, um, I would say that the answer to this is that God's providence mm -hmm. works and it demonstrates itself in a whole variety of different ways mm -hmm. in which. So the, the book is kind of looking at that. It's, it's a story book. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've used stories to try and show incidents in my life that, for me, I can only conclude that God had his hand in these events as right. they took place. And so I'll give you an example uh, of, of one. In eight? I, no, 1986. I left Washington and I went back to West Africa as the ADRA Regional uh, Vice President for all of the, uh, for 33 countries in Africa, basically. And we operated out of the division office there in Abidjan. And um, at, at, as I got into that job, I was working in a number of different countries. And of course, public health is one of my strengths. Uh, that God has given me and, and through training at Loma Linda. And so I was invited by the Minister of Health for the country of Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. which is the country above Ghana and yes. um, Cote d'Ivoire. Yes. And I was invited to come and talk to him about public health. Okay. Anyway, I was um, basically... I prepared for the trip. It was an 1100 kilometer trip by road. And as I prepared for uh, this, I had everything packed because I knew that in that 1100 kilometers, there was an area, the last 120 kilometers of the road, mm. you had to go through in the daytime. Why because of, well, because there were bandits on the road. Right. It was known as an area where there was a lot of trouble and there were bandits. So you always went through in the daytime. I'd been through it before. Anyway, so I was all prepared to leave early the next morning to go up there and see the Minister of Health. So that was my planning. Um, 
That evening, quite late, my um, tax machine starts rolling, and there's a request from uh, one of my colleagues in Washington, uh, one of the directors, um, who wanted, was on her way to Ghana, to a project in Ghana, and she had found that a flight had to go through Côte d'Ivoire and then another plane there, and she didn't have a visa for Côte d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. But it so happened that Adra was so well recognized by the government in Côte d'Ivoire that we had diplomatic status, mission diplomatique. And I, so I had a pass for the airport so I could walk out to an airplane or go through customs and border control, no problems at all. They honored that. So I was, to be honest, I, I was quite upset because I planned all of this and you had this it. journey to I get had this journey to right. get over but here's a colleague coming in and so i thought oh that's gonna pressure me anyway her, her plane was late finally it arrived i sat and talked to her behind you know um, border control and we decided a few things together and so it was lunchtime before i could get on the road Anyway, they have good roads in Cote d'Ivoire, all black top, uh, not all of them, but the main ones. Right. So, and I headed up there and made some extra time, a little bit over the speed limit. But anyway... Because um, you're trying to get there before nightfall. There, yeah, over. But I got to a town called Pocasabugu, um, which is on the Cote d'Ivoire side. And that was where you branch off to go up through this road that was notorious. So the sun was going down as I arrived. So my mind said to me, you know, David, it's no good. You're just going to have to get up real early in the morning and have to do the journey. So I locked my car, took my bag, and was checking into a little motel there where I could stay for the night. And as I, um, as I did that, I, I actually started writing the card and the lady in the hotel was there. Yes, we've got a room for you. Had the key in hand. And I just had this overwhelming impression that I should go on. And it, it defeated all any sensible thinking. It was silly to think that way. But the impression was there, so I thought, and I took my hand away from the card and I turned away and I thought it through and I used rational. No, you shouldn't go. You shouldn't go. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't take that risk. Right, stay here tonight. Stay here tonight. Because it's dangerous on the road. Go early in the morning. Okay. But again, as I started to finish the card, I just had this overwhelming impression that I should go. I can only describe it as that. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, you know, I told her in French, I said, I'm sorry, I have made a decision to go on. And she said, please, please be careful. This is a very dangerous road that you're going on. There's lots of accidents there, she said. So anyway, I left, got in the car and started driving. I was 70 kilometers into the journey Okay, I had very good headlights, halogen headlights, and I came round the bend of about 110, 120 miles, um, not mile an hour, <laughs> kilometers an hour. And here are five men standing across the road with sticks and a spear, and they're waving me down. And immediately my mind starts battering me with, you know, you're an idiot. Why have you done this? You know, you knew it was dangerous. Why have you done this? So I'm doing all of this and in a few seconds I'm thinking, oh, I might be able to squeeze around on that side, but then if they had guns, yeah. you know, I'm still in trouble. But again, I had this impression that I should stop. So I stopped in the middle of the road with my headlights on. The men came rushing around the car, opened the window, and they said in French, Please, please, please help us. We have a woman in labor and she needs to go to hospital. Wow. And I'd say, oh. So then I go. So it wasn't a hold up. No. It, it wasn't not a, a hold up. Well, it, 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 it was, was a hold up, but it wasn't dangerous. To get someone to get to the hospital. <laughs> I'd have done the same, I think. 
But anyway, um, so then I drove the car to the side of the road. They had her on a stretcher, mm -hmm. and there was no other, no other traffic on the road. And I knew there was a hospital at the town I was going to on the border. But those rural hospitals in those days were not well equipped. So not, they didn't have a doctor. And, you know, I, I, I had a lot of obstetrical experience. So anyway, I saw the lady and she was bleeding um, from the labor. And it was what we call a breach. Yeah. Yeah. So one leg had all, already been delivered. Yes, so it's complicated and you have to get the baby out quickly. Otherwise, it can get problems with the noxia. I won't go into those details. But um, anyway, I was there. I prayed. I delivered the baby. It was nothing I hadn't done before. Um, got the placenta out. And the thing was that she, um, you know, uh, got the placenta out. It had been torn. And that's why I was bleeding. And so anyway, they were so happy. And they said, well, we can take her home. We wouldn't need to go to hospital now. And so I went on my way. He said, well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I might say that at that point in time, HIV yeah. was strong there. No, and I didn't even have gloves. I had nothing. Um, and I had torn up a rag and what have you to clean myself. But I had blood all over my shirt. And anyway, I arrived in the uh, hotel late, and this lady sort of started screaming, he's been attacked, he's been attacked. And of course I had, so I had to tell her in French, no, no, it's, it's not that. Anyway, so I got cleaned up, had a shower, and washed myself very well, and went to bed. And I'm thinking, well, you know, what if? Mm -hmm. What if I had left when I was going to bed? What if I had listened to my mind that said you shouldn't have done it? Mm -hmm. But then if those ifs had come true, there would probably be two dead people, a baby and a, a, baby baby. And a mother. And so then I felt a bit happier about the fact that I left late. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I rode on um, the next morning, got to the Ministry of Health, went up to the minister's office and found that the minister had been called to, G to Geneva for a big uh, conference of World Health Organization. So he wasn't even there. So the whole purpose of your trip. Yeah. <laughs> it was so beautifully planned and what have you, had just been torn in two. Mm -hmm. And I was not exactly, ha I tried to be friendly with everyone, but I was not exactly happy with the secretary who apologized, but had failed to let me know. So I said, how am I going, what am I going to do? Just turn around and go back the same road. I had a choice of going back through Ghana, the next country, because we had a big program there in the north planting trees. In fact, where Adros planted trees in that place, now it's sub-Sahel. Um, the weather, they're starting to rain again. So it's much Change the climate. Change the climate. Absolute millions of trees have been planted up there. Anyway, um, so I said, oh, I'll call at the office in the north of the town called Tamale. Anyway, and again, remember that this was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. You know, Ghana is a very different place today. Yeah. But anyway, as I got near where I was going to stop, there were some houses, huts, that were burning. And people were running around, some of the people with bows and arrows, and bows and arrows. And anyway, I stopped on the side of the road, asked someone who was walking along the road, said, what's happening? Oh, he said, there's been a dispute between two groups, and one has stolen some, uh, not um, uh, stolen some of their food. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually guinea fowl mm -hmm. that they had done. <laughs> so he said, be careful, because a few people are being killed. So anyway, I, I went on in, in my Land Cruiser, and got to the office, at your office, and Deborah came, the director came out, running out when she saw me. She said, Pastor Sign, Pastor Sign, we've been praying that you would come. Hmm. Well, they didn't even know. I mean, no one knew that I was coming. 
Oh, God knew. Uh, but no one else knew that I was coming, and yet they were praying for me to come and sort their problem. She said, we've got a terrible problem. And she said, you've seen all the fighting that's going on. She said, um, come with me. And she took me up a little pot, and there was a generator up, which had the generator for them in the evenings, and uh, opened it, unlocked it, and there were two pairs of white eyes looking at me over the generator and they were a little boy and girl one was eight and the other was about five mm -hmm. and um they had gone home and their hut was burned down they didn't know where their parents were and they came running to adra and adra said okay we'll keep you safe so they said she said they've got relatives in kamasi which was 200 and 50 odd kilometers down the road, good road again, and uh, said, Okay, you want to, uh, where, you know, would you take them to the relatives? Then they'd be safe. So I had a land cruise. I mean, these days when we have a, you know, I've got a Prado and you push a button or a lever and uh, it changes the four wheel drive and all that the transfer case. But in that one, in those days, you had to go out the front and lock the wheels. Right. Yes. Okay, manually. From the outside. So I'd been traveling on hardtop, so there was no way I had them engaged. So I got in the car, started to go, and I had this impression, get out and engage the wheels. Right. I said, what's the matter with my mind? You know, something's going wrong there. But then I'm thinking back to the other when I and it worked out. So I got out and I put them in. As we were going out of town, they the fight had people who were fighting had put up a blockade. Mm -hmm. They were stopping cars and, and taking people off from the other group and off, off the buses and, uh, and the cars. And I had no room to turn around on the road. So here yes. I had these two kids in the back under a blanket. And I just put it into four-wheel drive and took off into the bush and drove for about four kilometers away from the road and then made a right turn. I'm good at following my nose, <laughs> had lots of experience, and then came out on the road world below and we got to Kamasi. So I'm driving from Kamasi to Accra and I'm trying to filter all of the stuff. By that time we rang and their parents had been found, they were alive. Uh -huh. And so that was okay. So the kids were happy. And I'm thinking here, this planned trip has gone belly up, as we say. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it hasn't worked out the way I intended it to work. But nonetheless, look what's happened. And, you know, this is what um, synchronization is talking about, mm -hmm. where uh, a, a seemingly untied events all come together. And mm -hmm. the bottom line is that as I drove along the, the coast road and back into Abidjan again, that by all of my planning, that had failed, but all of God's planning had saved four lives. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, that God was revealing himself in those situations. And, and I, I've only, re only really understood and it after I retired and started writing those stories up. And I said, how can you, how can you take God away from this story? You really cannot take God away from this story. It's inexplicable. And um, while Carl Jung would listen to this story happily and say, well, yeah, that's synchronicity, he'd also say, but well, I don't understand it. Right. But as a Christian right. and a believing Christian, I do believe it. And I do believe that in that instance, God went far beyond my own thinking and what have you. Uh, because where else did that impress, those impressions come? Yeah. And so that's really what the book is about, a series of stories of how God has, in different ways over a long life experience doing the work of Adra and the church overseas, um, how God um, is, is seen and makes himself and his, and, you know, himself present in our lives. And it's really thrilling when you see it. Yeah, in those I bet. Well, David, that's fantastic, um, and what a story. Um, next time, yeah. I'm, I want to ask you about how you've listened and followed 
and what that voice sounds like, those impressions sound like throughout your life. Okay. So stay tuned.